all good? Okay, so with our final session, we are going to start off with Grace Piles explaining why narwhal tusks are actually unicorn horns. So I'm just going to welcome Grace up. Hello. Uh, so hi, I'm Grace. I'm a second year PhD student. My thesis is about the narwhal tusks that were used as unicorn horns in medieval and early modern Europe. Today, we'll be exploring why the narwhal and the unicorn became so connected. In medieval Europe and up until the 16th century, a unicorn horn was one of the most precious items that you could own. Kings and churches used them as symbols of power and purity, and also as medicinal tools. Legend had it that the horn of a unicorn could neutralize any poison, cure any disease. Today, though, we would recognize many of these so-called unicorn horns as narwhal tusks. Why and how were they able to take on this new role in Europe? Many other horns could have been used as unicorn horns. In fact, many were. But today, the straight spiral horn stands out as a standard unicorn horn. Why? Uh, one note before we continue, unicorn horns were sometimes referred to as alicorns. I will be referring to the terms interchangeably throughout the talk. Uh, so let's ground this in reality a little bit. Um, the narwhal is a toothed whale that lives in the Arctic. It grows to an average of five meters long, and males grow tusks that can be up to three meters long. The tusks are actually their left incisors erupted through the lip, and they are very unique in the animal world. They have a natural spiral, which is unique. Um, they grow asymmetrically, even in the very rare cases where a narwhal grows two tusks, as shown above. Um, they both spiral to the left. They're not mirrored. Um, and narwhal tusks also have an inner cavity of pulp, whereas most animal tusks are solid all the way through. So narwhal tusks were widely introduced to Europe in the 10th century when Norse people colonized Greenland. Narwhal probably would have been too difficult for them to directly hunt at this time, but the tusks could be harvested from whales trapped in ice or picked up from the remains of whales on beaches. These tusks would become very valuable in Europe as they can be slotted into an already existing legend. So tales of one-horned hooved beasts have been around for a very long time. In fact, the first European to mention one is Stetius, a Greek author in the fourth century BC when he writes about the Indian ass in his book on India. Um, he describes it as a wild donkey with a single tricolor horn. Pliny the Elder also discusses several one-horned animals in his book on natural history, uh, but goes into the most detail about the monoceros, a ferocious wild creature that can never be captured alive, almost certainly a hyperbolized Indian rhinoceros. The later Roman author, Alien, copies both of their information in the second century BC, um, for unknown reasons, renames the Monoceros to the Cartazonis, but otherwise the information is basically the same. The, uh, of note is that the tusks or the, uh, the horns of the animals, the texture is not really described by any of these authors, except for Alien, who describes the horn of the Cartazonis as ringed or spiraled, but describes it as specifically black as well. Uh, but none of these guys were the medieval version of the unicorn yet. That would only be codified by the fourth century uh, with the Greek text Physiologus. This was an anonymously written text that describes various animals and uses them to teach Christian moral messages. The unicorn of Physiologus is a small goat-like creature with a single horn, uh, so wild it can never be captured except by one trick. If a beautiful maiden goes to the spot where he lives, uh, the unicorn will be attracted to her purity, fall asleep in her lap, at which point it can be captured or killed. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, this story was often used as a metaphor for the life of Jesus Christ, his birth to a virgin in Christian tradition, his eventual betrayal and death. And the physiologist is the grandfather of the European bestiary tradition. So the unicorn retains these Christian associations throughout the medieval period. So if we look at medieval bestiaries, medieval animal texts, uh, we see that the unicorn varies quite a lot. Here's some pictures uh, from the 13th and 14th centuries. And... Uh, you see the unicorns, different colors, sizes, shapes, resemble different types of animals, and their horns also uh, vary. They could be straight, curved, spiraled, smooth. Um, this reflects the fact that in the Middle Ages, many different materials were used as unicorn horns. Rhinoceros horn, walrus tusk, 
deer antler. The unicorn doesn't need to look consistent here because its allegorical association is what matters. In most medieval images, the unicorn is in the arms of a maiden being speared by a hunter. Its story is what identifies it, and it is that which is most important. Um, it is easily identifiable despite these physical differences. Um, but eventually this does change. The spiral horn becomes the standard. When? To attempt to measure this, I looked at various unicorn depictions from books and pictures throughout the 12th through 16th centuries. Uh, and I've noted six main types of horn in them. So types one, two, and three, smooth, no spirals. Type four, five, and six, spirals. Four and one, single curve. Uh, five and two, S-bend or multiple curves. Six and three, straight. So six, the spiraled straight horn, could be considered the narwhal type. And if we can see when this becomes more popular relative to other types, we can maybe see when narwhal tusks themselves became more popular in Europe. Uh, so we see that, looking at this graph, we do see them get more popular. The green bar here is the type six uh, at the top. Uh, of note is the narwhal type of unicorn horn first appears in the 13th century in art, but doesn't become the standard until the 15th and 16th century when almost all unicorns are drawn with a spiral horn. It still varies a great deal up to that point. Um, and we can compare this to a graph of alicorns that were in Europe at this time. So here's a graph of every European unicorn horn I could find in records or museums by century of first introduction to the continent. The striped bar is confirmed narwhal tusks. The blue bar is alicorns of unknown origin. If I find a record that says, this duke owned a unicorn horn, but it's not described, I don't know what it really was. Um, but looking at these graphs side by side, we can see that the 15th century, when alicorns seemed to become more popular, many of these alicorns in the unknown bar might have actually also been narwhal tusks because that lines up with when, in the 15th century, the unicorn horn becomes more standardized, becomes more primarily associated with that straight spiral shape. Uh, but why did the standardization happen? I would mainly attribute this to an emergence of a different way of looking at the world at this time. Over the 15th century, bestiaries were giving way to encyclopedias, and these texts were less concerned with animals as Christian moral guides and more concerned with them as creatures in their own right. In this 16th century encyclopedia by Conrad Gesner, the unicorn has escaped the maiden's arms, and uh, it even appears in the same series of texts as a rhinoceros and narwhal, two creatures that originally inspired its appearance. It is not just a false description of either of them, it's its own thing. Uh, so fine, but why would the narwhal tusk specifically be the candidate for true unicorn horn? Well, the narwhal was relatively unknown in Europe until the 1600s. As a very unique animal tusk, it was the only horn that could not be easily attributed to anything else. We see here in another 16th century encyclopedia, um, a kind author has given the reader a picture of a true unicorn horn. Don't get fooled by fake ones. But, <laughs> but we can see from the spirals outside and the cavity inside, it is clearly a cross section of a narwhal tusk that they're describing. So with this level of standardization came doubt. Once we can agree what the unicorn looks like, we can see that no such animal exists. Skepticism was very rife in the 1600s. This 1634 travel account uh, by Peter Mundy describes that uh, he says many conceive this unicorn horn to be from a fish rather than a beast. And uh, Ole Worm, a Danish physician in the mid-1600s, receives a narwhal tusk with the skull still attached. He publishes his findings and with that pretty much dispels any last scraps of proof in a terrestrial unicorn. So in conclusion, narwhal tusks were not the only unicorn horns, but they were the last. In fact, I argue that the use of narwhal tusk as unicorn horn prolonged belief in the unicorn due to its uniqueness and rarity and its inability to be attributed to anything else at the time. To the point that narwhal tusk retained some social prestige even after its true origins were widely known. Many 17th and 18th century narwhal tusk objects are described as being made of unicorn, including this, the Danish throne made in 1671 and including 36 different sections of narwhal tusk. In official record of its creation, it is described as a unicorn throne. 
The next step in my research will be to look more in person at narwhal tusk objects like this, and by microscopically examining the tool markings on them, I hope to determine more about how unicorn horns were made and used in context. I, the unicorn may be only legend, but that legend was kept alive by scholars, by artists, by traders using the real tusk of an incredible animal to give this strange sea creature a place at the tables of kings. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. It was really lovely and very fascinating. Does anyone have a question to start us off for Grace? I see a question in the front. Hello. Thank you very much for your talk. I'm just wondering a little bit, you, mentioned, you discussed the sociology and the religious symbolism of the unicorn. I do have to wonder, how did the unicorn horn become a symbol of prestige when the legend would be that basically it seemed to be an if you were the one who killed the unicorn, you were Judas. So how is that a source of prestige as opposed to a source of shame in a very Christian Europe? That's a really good question. The, um, I think the short answer is because in material, to, in, in, that's a good question. In uh, metaphorical terms, the um, unicorn was used as a metaphor for Jesus, but in material terms, because it was, could only be captured this one way, it was a very rare animal. And so to have one, a unicorn horn, was a very rare and precious object. But also, yeah, maybe uh, some conflict there. The unicorn's horn in Physiologus is described symbolically as representing like the unity of Jesus and God. And so to have one, like lots of churches had them to symbolize that unity, to be, they were carved into candlesticks, sometimes used as bishop staves as a symbolic representation of purity of God's power. You could look at this as a churchgoer and be like, oh, the power of God. So they could inspire that in people. The, um, yeah, but uh, the, it, its material rarity at that point was more important. Was there some differentiation <clears throat> in uh, the Middle Ages between magical and non-magical creatures, or is the unicorn considered just any other animal, like a horse or a lion? And if so, what makes a creature magic? Is it the horn? Is it the horse? That's a really good question. Yeah, in um, medieval Europe, as far as I can deter determine, the unicorn was not a particularly special creature relative to anything else. The um, I say that it's used as a metaphor for Jesus. If you look at the physiologists, I've counted one third of the animals are used directly as metaphors for Jesus. Um, and uh, other animals in the bestiaries are given what we today would think of as magical qualities. Uh, the lion is usually said to have cubs that are born dead and then the lion roars at them after three days and they come back to life. So at that, at that time, it's not so much a magical creature as it is, this is a quality that this animal has. Um, that, you know, a, a Christian God may be created and put into the world. And uh, that's not conceptualized as particularly unnatural. It is a, a natural thing with its own qualities, just like anything else has their own qualities. Thank you. That was really interesting. A narwhal tusk would have been available to other other cultures that were non-Christian. So, so sort of in northern Canada, in China, was the narwhal tusk associated with other animals like that, or was it in myths of other kinds? Other, so you talk very much strongly Europe and the Christian culture, but how, how about in other cultures? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, tragically, I have to specify Europe in my talk because it's it's outside the scope of my research to really get into many other cultures. I can say that for the Inuit in Native America, in Greenland, the narwhal itself, really important animal, um, sort of, of entirely outside any tradition of the unicorn. Uh, and also in, uh, there are, I'm not sure, I don't know enough about East Asia to really speak to that, but I do know that in um, like medieval Islamic tradition, there's a certain material that's uh, written about in uh, texts called kutu. It's made into knife handles traditionally. It's supposed to sort of sweat when it's near poison so it can protect you. 
Um, and scholars today think that one of the materials used to make this was narwhal tusk that came either from European trade routes or from Asian trade routes. Um, unfortunately, I can't speak much more to, the, uh, to, the, to, to it beyond that. Thank you so much, Grace. I think, if, I think we might move on just in the case of time. Sorry, Meg. But uh, another round of applause for Grace. All right, we're going to move on to our next speaker, which is Yorick Feynman. Um, he'll be talking about how animals changed the world during the Cambrian explosion by using the rock record to reconstruct 500 million year old environments. All right, hi everyone. Um, my name is Jorik Feynma, and uh, I will be talking about how animals changed rocks, or more specifically, how the geological rock record changed when animals first evolved some 500 million years ago. I'd like to start with one of the core principles of geology, which is that the present is the key to the past. This is a phrase that was thought up by Charles Lyell, based on the work done by James Hutton in the 1700s. And to show you how it works, we can take a look at the Wolfson College Porter's Lodge. If we look up close at the rocks of its outer wall, we can see that it consists mostly of all these small little whitish spheres, which are a specific type of sand called ooids. And by using what we know about how this forms, which is that it mostly forms in tropical environments on the beach, we can infer that the product, that is the rock, was in fact formed in an environment that looked something like this, except probably without the hammock. <laughs> and by using this exact reasoning for rocks of all sorts of different ages and in a, rock, a lot of different places, um, geologists have come up with this. This is the geological time scale um, with the younger stuff at the top and the older stuff at the start of the earth, really, at the bottom. Um, and it has all the big names. It has the Pleistocene at the top, it has the Cretaceous, the Jurassic, and the period which I will be talking about today, which is the Cambrian, that's in the sort of faint reddish color some 500 million years ago. Before I get to the Cambrian though, I want to talk about these four red arrows. And what these are, are specific intervals in Earth's history that in one way or another resemble modern day climate change. And these intervals usually get some sort of fancy acronym and receive a lot of attention from the scientific community because we want to learn what has happened in the past in order to better understand what might happen in the future as the climate continues to, ch to change. So the phrase, the present is the key to the past, is nowadays accompanied by the phrase, the past is the key to the future. However, all the data from these intervals in Earth's history is recorded in rocks, so we must make sure that we understand how exactly rocks record Earth's history. And in order to do that, we need to look at the Cambrian explosion, because it was the Cambrian explosion that established the modern Phanerozoic Eon. That's the light green uh, column all the way on the left there. It's the eon in which all of these intervals um, that resemble modern day climate change marked by the red arrows took place. And it's also the geological eon in which we still live today. The Cambrian explosion was when animals first evolved. And when you look for pictures of the Cambrian explosion on Google Images, you get all sorts of weird beasts and artist depictions. Um, and the reason why we have those is because the biology of the Cambrian explosion is actually quite well understood. We have a decent idea of what life looked like at the time and how it evolved. But what we don't really know is how these animals interacted and changed the landscapes in which they lived. And that's important because it is in those landscapes that rocks are formed. So two ways that I will discuss today is first by uh, the fact that animals take up material, which I'll get to in a second, and the um, fact that animals were digging down into the seafloor sediment, which is what you can see that little worm doing in the bottom right. So this is a chunk of modern day sediment from the Dutch Wadden Sea, and you can see that it's full of life. There's all sorts of little worms and, and shells in it that have dug themselves down into the sediment. And they got there by making a little tunnel. You can recognize these tunnels at the top, the sort of vertical structures, 
And what's notable about them is that they have a, a different color than the surrounding rock. And what that means is that because oxygen was able to get into the sediment, it was able to oxidize the carbon that produces the gray color in the rest of the rock, thus changing the composition of the sediment itself. So both the structure of the rock was changed in that there are now physical tunnels there, and the composition of the rock was changed only because animals were there to dig into the sediment. Before animals existed, this would not have happened. So let's look in the geological record for evidence that this uh, developed through time. So this is what we call a geological section. It's a rock succession with the older rocks at the bottom, the younger rocks at the top. It's been tilted on its side, so we can now walk along this beach in Wales, walking from the older rocks to the younger rocks on the right. So on the left, the rocks you can see are sort of reddish behind that person that's standing there. Um, and that's rocks that predate the, the Cambrian explosion. Animals did not exist yet. On the right, the rock is not nearly as red. And if we take a look up close, we can see these tiny little circles. So what these are are trace fossils called Aranicolites, and they're basically the fossil remnants, not of the animal, but of the tunnel. Basically, if you cut a tunnel across, they're tiny little circles. So that shows that the structure of the rock was changing at this time because animals did exist and they were digging down into the sediment. And given that the surrounding rock is not really that red at all, um, it shows that the composition might have changed as a result of this as well. So that shows that animals were interacting with their environments and changing the way in which rocks were made, changing both the structure and their composition. The latter of which might have indirectly changed geochemical cycles and the climate, but more directly it changed how rocks are produced. A second way in which that happened is by the fact that animals take up a lot of material. They have skeletons like all of us, and some of those might, leave, uh, might stay behind to form a fossil. So when you think of a fossil, you might think of a T-Rex or something really rare and special. But actually, fossils in general are really not all that rare. If you take any rock from the last 500 million years or so, chances are that it contains at least some fossil material. And then there are also rocks that consist predominantly of fossils. And that's what this picture shows. This is a cave on the Isle of Arran. And um, you see all the spherical structures at the ceiling of this cave are all individual shells. They're called brachiopods, and basically this entire uh, rock in which the cave was later formed consists of fossils. This entire rock would not have existed if animals had not evolved 500 million years ago. So this shows that animals are actually adding a lot of material to the environment and making and changing the pace at which rocks are forming. You can see that in this graph. This is the pace at which rocks are forming throughout geological time, and you can see that before animals evolved on the right, the rate at which rocks were being formed was much lower than after animals evolved. And that's because animals are adding a lot of material and changing the rate at which rocks are forming. So strangely, this changes the relationship between time and rock. You can think of it like this. Let's say I give you a diary and I tell you to fill up one page in a given month. You might, for example, write down one or two sentences for every single day so that at the end of the month you filled your page and you have information on all the days, but you don't have a lot of detail. Your record is very complete, every day is there, but you don't have a lot of details about any of those days. You've only written down one or two sentences. On the other hand, you might choose to just fill up the page with a very detailed account of day one of the month and then hand that in at the end of the month, which means that you have a very detailed account of one specific day, but 29 out of 30 days, assuming it's April, are missing. So your record is very detailed, but not very complete. And it works the same for rocks. So before animals existed, and there wouldn't have been as much material to build rocks with, there would have been more slow rocks, what I call slow rocks. Basically, forming in environments where there's not a lot of material, which leads to slow and constant deposition uh, it's, and resulting in a very complete rock record, analogous to writing down one or two phrases a day, but resulting in not a lot of detail. After animals evolved, and if there would have been more sediment to work with, rocks would have filled up the available space much faster, analogous to writing down the page on the first day of the month, and then resulting in a very accurate and detailed record of only 
part of the time. A lot of time is actually missing, but what we do record has a lot of detail. So how variable is this speed of rocks? Well, I think that after animals evolved and when they introduced more material to the environments in which rocks are formed, um, that, that's, that that would have changed the relationship between time and rock. We also saw that when animals started digging down into the seafloor, they changed the structure and composition of the rock. So when animals evolved for the first time some 500 million years ago, not only did they change the history of the earth, but they also changed how this history is recorded in sedimentary rocks. And that's important when we want to look at these four red arrows to understand the future when the climate continues to change, because we better make sure we understand how these moments and how these intervals that resemble modern day climate change are actually recorded in rocks. I hope I've convinced you that the answer to that lies in the Cambrian explosion. And uh, that's why I will be grabbing my little tent for the rest of my PhD to try to find and study as many Cambrian rocks as I can, um, to try to figure out how animals, when they first evolved, changed the language in which the rock record is written. Thank you so much. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions. <laughs> Thank you, Jorik. That's a really interesting presentation. Does anyone have any questions? I have a very naive question just to start with. When you said that in that on that beach in Wales, yeah. um, the 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 sediment. I, did the rock fall? How is it linear and not like vertical? Basically, how time is? It's a good question, actually. Um, so these rocks, like most sedimentary rocks, would have formed horizontally to form a sort of pancake of rock layers. But as, due to plate tectonics, plates collide with each other and they form mountain change and rocks are uplifted, which they would have been because these are formed in the sea and now they're on land. So they've been uplifted and as they uplift, they might sort of bend. And as they bend and form a sort of fold of rock, um, some of them in one limb of that fold, if you will, will be inclined. So they can be at a small angle or they can be very steep and they can even turn all the way around, which would mean that at that point, the older rocks are at the top, which makes it very tricky to study them. But that's why uh, we, have, we have things in rocks to, to, uh, to figure that out. Uh, nice talk. I'm just interested in your, actually in that, in that picture, the colour of the rocks. Yes. You mentioned when the, when the animals arrived, we've got a different colour of the rocks, I. Is that because of the change in the atmosphere which is produced by the animals or by the presence of the animals in the rock? Um, well, there's a lot of things that play into what makes the color of a rock. And it's not always clear what exactly that is. For example, organic matter, um, for example, in coals or in uh, sandstones that contain a lot of oil will stain the rock so that it's already black even though there's only 0.5% organic matter. So it's not necessarily that the dominant component of any rock makes up the color. So in this case, the rock was red because there's um, a pigment in there called iron oxide, basically rust. And the fact that it was not there on the right-hand side of the picture is not necessarily because the climate changed, um, but more because the animals were digging down into the sediment and uh, changing the chemistry of the pore waters in between the already deposited sand. So basically, the uh, redox conditions, as you call them, the, the extent to which iron can be oxidized, the extent to which rocks want to rust, if you will, would have changed because animals introduced new materials and new seawater with a different composition into the rock. Yeah, we have time for one more quick. Uh, I thought vol volcanic, volca uh, you know, it's much more associated with volca uh, volcanic eruption activity than anything else. Uh, did you consider that? Because usually it's associated with that activity. Red, red rocks, you mean specifically? No, uh, uh, activity of uh, water.
rock and uh, the rock is angry. Which is why the rocks are on their side, you mean? Well, Volk, I think it's the other way around. Because mountains are building, that often goes hand in hand with volcanoes being there. And volcanoes can in turn get rocks up there and tilt them. But it's not necessarily always a driving process. Um, in this case, this is in Wales. Um, it would have been associated with some volcanics, but they ceased about 400 million years ago. So it didn't, well, it slightly cooked the rocks, admittedly, <laughs> um, making them slightly more difficult to study. It's still possible. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it didn't, doesn't impact the results of this section anymore. Great, thank you, Jorik. I think you. that's uh, our time. <laughs> Thank you.